for 2020 uh, in my practice and with our colleagues at Sarah Cannon, Tennessee Oncology, Florida Cancer Specialists and our other partners, really trying to emphasize education around the new agents that are available and where they can best be utilized, hoping to stimulate greater interest in clinical trials, really pushing our physicians to consider molecular profiling of their patients' tumors, and having molecular cancer conferences to support the discussions around the results. We're investing heavily in trying to make the data coming back from molecular profiling both accessible and understandable for our physicians, and that's really one of our big commitments for 2020. I am always working on trying to increase access to clinical trials. I'm, I'm proud through the Sarah Cannon Cancer Network that we're able to offer clinical trials in the community and so just selecting the best trials and getting them in the hands of the patients where they live and, and work is really important to me and so just continuing to have best in class clinical trials available to my patients. My New Year's resolution in practice is to be more present. Same with my personal life, right? And to encourage my patients to be more present too. I think it's always a temptation when you have another patient waiting in another room, uh, you know, to, to speed through things, uh, but to really just focus on the present and deal with the next room uh, later. Uh, the other resolution I have is just to continue to try to educate about clinical trials. I think clinical trials are so important, not only for the future, but also for our patients today. Uh, there's been great studies that have shown that patients that participate in a clinical trial have equal outcomes, if not quite honestly better outcomes than those where they're treated with standard of care. And so I think we really need to educate across America, not just to patients that currently have cancer, not just to providers, but for the lay person, because you never know when somebody might be diagnosed with cancer, what a clinical trial is, what it isn't, and why they're important. Focus um, for my patients um, is really going to be to continue to explore biological combinations. I think one of the most challenging is the signal from the immunotherapies. And so while we've had success in the triple negative population, I think there's been promising data in the HER2 population. And we're going to be participating in a trial with the endocrine positive um, tumors as well. So I think, you know, looking at my partners who deal with a variety of other solid tumors that have had some clear home runs with immunotherapy. I'd like to see that broaden beyond just the triple negative patient population. I take care of a lot of people at high risk for developing melanoma. Um, we use a lot of advanced imaging um, and we are using some tools uh, in that area to improve our diagnostic accuracy. I'm not talking about those tonight, um, but I think we are always trying to stay on the cutting edge of new developments there uh, to try and reduce the number of biopsies of benign lesions while not missing uh, melanoma and catching melanoma at the earliest possible stage. So uh, that's always our goal. So looking at education and expanding education opportunities, um, really diving into the nuances of each of the toxicities and trying to get more information out there for colleagues as well as patients. Um, but I, I really enjoy making sure that my colleagues are really well prepared so that they can empower themselves so they can provide the best care and translate that to the patients and just enhancing patient safety and um, trying to minimize toxicity that results in acute care interventions if at all possible. Sometimes it's not, but sometimes it is. So really diving in and getting that information out there in, in really nitty gritty detail. One of the biggest things in uh, non-malignant hematology that we face is the large wait times uh, for patients in times of access. So I think uh, throughout the country, I think we're looking at how to practice non-magnet hematology in a more novel way. So one of the things we're looking at is trying to do more of an e-consults and maybe telemedicine into the practice just because that could reduce wait times. And at the same time, we could give high quality care to patients who are three, four hours away that don't have to drive all the way just for simple things like a low white count because most of these could be dealt on a telemedicine consult. I think trying to, and also, I think there's a huge shortage of non-malignant hematologists across the country. So uh, trying to find an expert and then trying to get an appointment, it could be, uh, that could be frustrating because of the wait time. So I think trying to use these uh, telemedicine, telehealth, e-consults uh, is something that we're trying to focus on this year to see if we can give more access uh, to our patients for better non-malignant hematology care. 
came across a quote that was in uh, social media that, that I saw on Twitter that was talking about patients and their participation in clinical trials. And what it was describing is that perhaps we really shouldn't be thinking about patients who enroll in, in trials as things, you know, using the terminology of subjects or patients. It's more that they're collaborators, right? Because we really can't move forward in future treatments uh, for other patients without their uh, time and dedication to the trials. So I think in this new year, I think that continuing to focus on um, the gratitude that we have for patients when they participate in clinical trials because we will not, would not be where we are now without um, their um, collaboration. Uh, and you know, hopefully five, 10 years, things will really change. One of the things we're really focusing on are um, enhancing patient provider communication. So focusing on using uh, electronic um, uh, media, whether it's through the electronic medical record or patient reported outcomes, to better understand the symptoms that our patients are experiencing, uh, even between those uh, long visits, because some patients don't come in that often. I think the second thing is to really focus on what patients can do themselves to improve their outcomes. So, you know, spending a little bit of time talking about exercise and diet and not smoking and limiting alcohol can have a big effect for cancer prevention. Starting February 1st, we're switching over to a brand new electronic health record, <laughs> which uh, um, is like causing palpitations in, in all of us because we see a large volume of patients and, and we want to be efficient and um, you know, documentation is important, but you also don't want to lose that personal touch when it comes to, to talking to your patients, especially when, it, when you're dealing with a lot of really sensitive issues. So um, my hope is that when we switch over to this new system that it won't interfere with that uh, patient provider interaction, that human touch that we really need. One of the things that I've been focused on in my own practice is finding ways to uh, uh, to minimize the use of opioids. I think that's something that's really important to all of us. It's in the headlines all the time. And we're always having to find a balance between making sure the patient's comfortable, but m there's a lot of studies that show that opioid use after surgery in particular is kind of a lead-in uh, into uh, abuse and addiction and those types of things. So we're working as a group to, to formalize ways to minimize narcotics but still keep the patients comfortable. My resolution is helping patients understand better the both the efficacy of the treatment options and also the potential side effects and impact on their quality of life. And we're hoping to create some educational tools to help make patient to help patients make better choices for themselves. For me I would say it's, it's making sure that my patients are cared for in more than just a medical way, I guess is the way to say it, to make sure they're supported in an emotional way. This is a very challenging diagnosis for patients to accept sometimes, um, especially at initial diagnosis. Most patients uh, you know, get, the, get, get the hang of it, so to speak, after a couple of months of chemotherapy, but I do believe that that's uh, something that you know, I would like to do better. I'd like to make sure that my patients are supported you know, in, in every aspect, not just making sure that they're getting the best therapy. And, and uh, I'd like to make sure that they're supported emotionally and, uh, as well as physically.